even on an, on an average snow year, they need to clear the streets to keep the streets open for traffic. So we have to put the snow back down to put in a track for the dog teams. So it's not unusual for us to be doing this. What is unusual is the fact that we don't have a lot of snow and we've had to stockpile it since November to be able to put this together. For this year, this is the one of the lower snow totals. We've got about 27, 28 inches of snow, excluding today's amount. Um, which is about half of what we normally have had in an average snow year. So it's been very dry within the Anchorage area. We typically use between 400 and 1,000 loads of snow from dump trucks to make the Anchorage start work. In a, in a low snow year such as this year, we've, we've been unable to maintain the trails in the, in the, in the outlying areas. Anchorage has not had to change its course since 1994. This is only the second time since 94 that we've shortened the course within the city of Anchorage. The restart or real start of the race has been moved to Fairbanks twice in the last several years due to low snow conditions on the primary trail that we use. We try to stay on our traditional trail systems as best we can. Due to snow conditions in some of the more critical areas, Dalzell Gorge being one of them, if you don't have the snow to be able to make it through there safely, we're gonna reroute the course to where some to someplace safer. And so it's about the safety of the, the, the dogs, the competitors, and the sport. We are moving at a breakneck speed this morning to get all, all of our teams through the starting line before the snow melts because that's all we've got. We're out. There is no more. We'll have to send out for it. Somebody call Canada. See if they got it. I'm fascinated that the alders are blooming this early. It is now, what, the 28th? It's the end of April. And usually here by the glacier, the things don't start blooming for another month, start emerging like this. Uh, so this is just strikingly early, which coincides with all the climate data that's been coming out about the warmest winters on record and the warmest summers on record, certainly for Alaska. And uh, so they're, they're coming on early. Who knows what that'll mean for the longevity of them because they'll have to adapt to it. But uh, it's pretty striking to see these willows and alders coming on so, so early in the year. It's 
So living in Palmer, Alaska, I think one of the things I really appreciate about, com appreciate about coming up here to the Knick Glacier is just that the valley, our valley with Palmer and, and the other towns is really dominated by these glaciers. And mostly what we feel the effect of is the wind because it's really windy out of these glaciers. And the wind carries silt and what happens is the, the glaciers as they move forward and, and recede, the rock that they're on gets exposed and, and ground up by the pressure and, and friction of the glacier itself. And it creates this fine silt out of the rock, which gets caught by the wind and blows into town. And sometimes we'll have a mile high cloud of dust that chokes us all out. And it's, uh, it's such fine particles that it'll actually can be damaging to the lungs. And so we have to curtail our exercise like you would if it was smog, but here it's just lus, which is the German word for windblown silt. And the lus then deposits in the flats, and that's what's made this to be the agricultural hub of Alaska, is this amazing soil that we have here. And um, it's really high in potassium, but it's really low in phosphorus and nitrogen, so people have to add a lot of organics to make it uh, more fertile, but the texture of it is, is unbelievable. And this glacier has receded uh, two miles in the last 20 years it's receded, which is, is pretty notable. There's still a lot of people that it's, a, it's difficult to accept the science of climate change. I think it's, it's been constant in that it's inconsistent. We have, we have uh, uh, wet years and dry years and, and cool summers and warm summers and it, people that try to forecast the weather are horrible at their job. They, they can't give us accurate for, weather forecasts when it comes to what might happen two days from now. When I was like uh, five years old, I, I followed my dad around and we had to actually dig people out of their houses because there was so much snowfall in one night. But it does not happen no more. It's something that's you know, subtle enough and that's where I think some people um, balk at, at the whole concept of, of whether or not it's, it's a for real thing. Every year is different, but at, uh, as far as any major changes, I can't say that I see any. We've had our droughts, we've had our rainy years, but uh, uh, I can't, can't say that I've seen any major changes. Well, of course, the, uh, what's being discussed these days is the uh, very abrupt and rapid amount of climate change that we're experiencing. And some of the effects from that are increased uh, forest fires, the, the scope and the scale and the size of the, the forest fires that we're having, the, the frequency of the fires that we're having is pretty massive and we really don't have the resources to be able to contain the, the forest fires like we'd like to. This year, for some reason, like we have no snow and that's very important to our culture because we need that snow for our berries and for everything to grow. And when no snow, it means like we're gonna go hungry. A lot of people can prove statistically that this is just within the normal variability of what weather can do. If you get a, an extremely cold winter, an extremely warm summer, a hot, dry California, for instance, that it's just within the normal variability within climate. And we've only been around in this country and we've only been civilized for 10,000 years. So for us to, you know, to, to make bold predictions based on our small sample size, you know, that could be incorrect. I do know that there have not been levels of carbon dioxide items and that's, that's one of the, just one of the greenhouse gases, not the one I'm worried about, I'm worried about methane. But, it, you know, the records are higher than they have been, and not ever in the geologic record, but in the record since humans have been on Earth. 
I'd like to think that it's different because I think that we see more of the extremes and the changes and we're hearing about it more here in Alaska. So I would like to think that it's different, that Alaskans are more aware of the changes that are happening. But, um, but I, you know, I wouldn't guarantee it. Unfortunately, I think it's been marketed as a political topic and, and they use it as, a, as um, you know, just another um, trick in their bag of tricks of ways to get people polarized and separated on the issues. I told my dad, we as a human are our own demise. We are going to destroy ourselves. Now, in Alaska, approximately 58% of the organic material that's here is carbon. So there is a tremendous amount of carbon that's tied up in these organic mats. So as it warms up, the organic material starts to decompose and the organic mat will collapse. As the organic mat collapses, the insulative quality of the surface organics is diminished significantly, so the site starts to warm up. As it warms up, the permafrost below starts to melt. However, approximately 40% of the carbon that is sequestered or tied up in upland landscapes on the planet are within this, within this subarctic and arctic uh, regions. So we have an amazing amount of carbon, and it's so contingent about uh, the air temperature that this carbon stays uh, sequestered or locked up into these systems. If our temperatures go up, this carbon is gonna start to come out of the ground and go back into the atmosphere. Soils are one of the most critical natural resources that we have as a nation, but they're also one of the most underutilized, underappreciated natural resources that we have. Farmers and ranchers and people who've lived on the land for hundreds of years have known the importance and the value of soils. But when you talk to people today and ask them about the natural resources of the United States, the first thing that they'll say is coal, oil, natural gas. Nobody ever mentioned soil. But soil is where we grow our food. It's where we provide fiber that we make our clothes from. It's where we grow our timber that we build our houses from. So I view it as one of the most important natural resources that we have, yet one of the most underappreciated. So permafrost is uh, um, soil, which, simply speaking, soil that will not thaw uh, for at least two years. More kind of scientific definition based on temperature. And it says that uh, any earth material which is at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more consecutive years, that is permafrost. There's plenty of it in Alaska. There's different types of permafrost. Areas where you'll find it everywhere is continuous permafrost. Areas where you'll find patches of it, which is discontinuous permafrost more in Fairbanks interior area. We're standing on a section of the Glen Highway. We're in the zone of discontinuous permafrost. Permafrost underlies most of the landscape here with the exception of large water bodies and under rivers. This area is real susceptible to surface alterations that change the thermal properties of the surface of the, of the vegetation. So anything we do in this environment to alter the thermal regime can easily cause melting of the permafrost. This section of the road that we're on here is a prime example of that alteration. The black surface of the asphalt conducts a lot of heat into the ground and it causes the permafrost to melt. 
Now, this is, this is big because uh, with our climate changing and our air temperatures starting to rise, this sort of a phenomenon is gonna become more common. And there are estimates uh, for interior Alaska that we're gonna spend an additional two to six billion dollars in just maintenance on these, the roads in interior Alaska and buildings that occur on this permafrost as it starts to warm up and it starts to degrade. So this is a pretty good example on what to expect across this landscape with warming temperatures. If you can't quantify your resources, if you don't know how much carbon is in the soil and how much carbon and methane is in the permafrost, how will you be able to calculate the impact if there is change? So we have to know what the resource base is before you can make policy decisions. And this area is not one that would have much of an Im agricultural impact if we don't know the soils. It would be more so that we would be uh, losing carbon and emitting methane over vast areas and we would not even be aware of it. If someone doesn't know that there's a problem, there is no problem. If, they, if you can quantify it for them, then they can make a decision. And soil survey is the absolute best way to provide that resource information to legislators and administrators and people that can make uh, broad, broad scale decisions that would make a lasting change or real change. I, dis I think in uh, 1985, 26, I did my first one. That was just interior Alaska locally. And gradually I expanded that to uh, southeast Alaska, uh, in Juneau, Ketchikan area, a couple of times. Then in uh, 92, I decided, I mean, Alaska, with all the permafrost, I decided to shift my program from south central Alaska north to the permafrost region. So then from 93, I had my first field trip class. With some of Chen Lu's work, the research that he's conducted, the different dynamics across the landscape, the variability that we've seen in Arctic soils, an entire new soil order was created with multiple sub suborders underneath that. And he's really helped to define a lot of the variability, the different features of Arctic soils, what they can be used for, uh, how they're described, and even unique types of testing that we do in the laboratory or in the field for describing these Arctic soils. Because again, it's very different than what we do in the lower 48. We've, we've been really fortunate with Chin Lu uh, being here because he's a very motivated, unselfish individual in terms of his science. And he uh, encouraged a lot of young scientists to pursue a career in soil science. and. Uh, and has instilled in him the importance of, of knowing this resource. We were figuring the other day that Chin Lu has had over 500 students that have traveled up the Hall Road to look at subarctic and Arctic soil. Chen Lu's published tons of papers, and so he hasn't published everything that's in his head, but I can at least go back and, and read some of what he thought and said. A little bit less is true with people that worked on soil survey. They don't get it, you know, they're not academics, so they don't have as much of a chance to leave this paper trail, which is a huge problem because a lot of times those are the people that know the most about a particular landscape. And they can tell you, you know, like Mark can be out here with Mark and he'll say, um, yeah, you know, just over there, I think the soils look like this. And so he, you, really people who can read the landscape and understand um, what soils look like and, and how that may affect their use. That guy has, what is it, 32 years of experience, I don't know, 10, 15,000 holes he's dug. That's, that's about stories, you know? I mean, I can dig a hole, I can describe a hole, I can tell you what the processes are, but he's, he's got like 15,000 stories that have been told to him, and he's, he, it's like, you know, invaluable. It, it, I'm just so grateful that they're both here and they're both available, and, and I plan on picking their brains until they no longer accept my phone calls.
Is another? One. Okay. Yeah. 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 Since I've been in Alaska, I've noticed a lot of differences uh, in in, uh, in in the climate uh, that that has uh, that's changed over that time that I've been here. Areas in the western part of the state that uh, used to have permafrost that uh, uh, that permafrost was uh, fairly sensitive to temperature change, and uh, in the past 30 or so years that permafrost has uh, basically disappeared from from the ground. And we've been able to document that based on certain characteristics that the soils have that tell us that the soil was wet and it, that it was frozen at the time. And uh, both those characteristics are now, um, are now, are now gone in those uh, permafrost sensitive soils. If we start to lose interior Alaska's permafrost by the end of the century, we're looking at fully 20% of the carbon on the planet going from the terrestrial system into the atmosphere. That's huge in terms of temperature change. They're not going to replace him at the university as much as I have heard. And I, I really feel that uh, I wish they would. I think that's needed. We need some soil scientists at universities that can continue his research, that continue the publications, that can continue taking pictures, that can go to professional meetings and teach people what, what they're seeing up here, tell them the story about the permafrost, how it's changing, the hydrology, the vegetation, what they see, the impacts of the pipeline. All of this is really important, so it's gonna be a big loss for soil science. Under the forest, there are massive ice wedges in the ground uh, where the ground is permanently frozen, permafrost. When those ice wedges melt, the ground collapses and that sinkhole or collapse hole fills with water. And that water then is warmer than the surrounding ground. So it starts to thaw or eat into the permafrost and thaw it. So the lake gets bigger uh, as, it, as it expands. The permafrost soil, the frozen soil and the forest carbon become food for microbes that live in the bottom of the lake. And so microbes are down there eating this carbon year round, generating greenhouse gases, methane and carbon dioxide. In the winter, when the ice freezes on the lakes, those bubbles come up through the water column and they hit the bottom of the ice. And the ice then freezes down, trapping the bubbles that keep, keep continually rise up in place. So if you were to um, look down or, or pull some of the ice out, the ice acts like a time-lapse photograph of bubbling. And, the lakes just trap massive amounts of methane gas. And, um, and our job is to come out and quantify how much methane is here. And when that ice melts in the spring, 
the methane goes into the atmosphere and it's there, it traps the incoming solar radiation and um, adds to warming of the climate. Warming of the climate causes more permafrost to thaw. More permafrost thaw fuels more methane production, more methane to the atmosphere, more warming, so you get this uh, positive feedback cycle of permafrost thaw and, and methane release. I grew up in a fairly small town in western Washington and in some ways it kind of had that sense of community but there was still kind of the disconnectedness and but this is different I mean it is community to the nth degree that you know like a large family you know if someone dies you know, the funeral, funerals are a big thing, you know, to come together and support the family. I want to just say it feels nice, but it's more than that, you know. Um, the, it's, it's just a special place. Shishmaf uh, averages a population of about 600 people, and about 90, 95, 97 percent are native. There's really nothing here to help people survive. Um, the only um, reason we're here is, is mainly because we subsist off the ocean and off the land. And um, that's our primary reason why Shishmaf is located here. We love to be close to the ocean. You know, it's it's hard life, you know, living here in Sismarath, in a village, you know. People don't realize, you know, that, you know, we are, you know, part of the United States, but we are currently living in a third world country area. Our lifestyle is a real hard life. We've, we're always out there with, uh, dangerously because of rotten ice or that kind of, or rough seas. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle, you know, we kind of grew up with. Some things that people don't understand is how connected that the people here are to the land and the sea. It's a, it's a dependency. Some people will talk about how the ocean and the land are, you know, their grocery store, so, so to speak. But, I mean, it's, it's a connectedness that's really strong that um, people from the lower 48 aren't going to understand. We used to have um, about half a mile of shoreline, and that never used to bother. It was just peaceful. 
but now the waves are pounding against our seawall, which um, is very uncommon. That is dangerous, especially to our children. Um, they are not aware of the severity of our erosion. The worst is having, they call it the silent storm, where the ocean and the lagoon rise with water, and then a storm comes and it'll slap both ways. And that's where we see um, high waters that comes too close to our village, which never happened before in my lifetime. It's a matter of time when we'll get hit. We have, of course, the uh, huge impact from receding ice and uh, the fact that we no longer have shore fast ice in the abundance and the duration that we're used to having. So we get uh, larger and more impactful coastal storms. And those storms, of course, have a tremendous impact on a number of communities throughout the state. Actually, I have up on my board here a list of communities at risk. I have uh, 26 of them listed up there, and I think there are actually more than 30 that are at risk from some sort of, uh, whether it's river erosion, uh, river flooding, uh, coastal erosion, uh, storm surge impacts to those villages. And so all of those are really coming from a rapid change in, in climate. Why are so many of these Native American villages at risk? It's because they've built their towns and their villages often along the coast that provides the best access to hunting and fishing. But as our permafrost crumbles and melts, and as the autumn sea ice comes later and later in the year, we see that storms that used to crash harmlessly on the sea ice miles out from the town, those storms are now crashing on the land instead. And they're not crashing on solid frozen ground, they're crashing on ground that has been melting and crumbling. And so whenever that autumn storm comes, it rips away feet, even yards of coastline, leaving many of these villages hanging off the edge of a cliff and often crumbling right into the ocean. When the waves would come in, I mean, it, it was a crazy storm. Um, it was b blowing 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, it, the storm surge was pushing 10 feet. And uh, I remember you could just feel the waves hitting. And so when, the, when a wave hit, the building shook. From here, not even here to that house, maybe from here to the, say, 20 feet, that's how far I was from the ocean. During the fall storms, when the waves hit on the rocks, we can feel it. The snow fence that protects the runway from gathering lots of snow also insulates the permafrost, and that's the most unstable area. If the erosion gets to that point, it's gonna go really fast, and then it's gonna go right through the runway. So, you know, that it's certainly a major concern because you know, what are you going to do now? You, know, you bring a bunch of Blackhawks, you know, how, how are you going to fulfill that need to evacuate the people? About 40 years ago, um, Shishmaf kind of voted to relocate because they noticed the island and, uh, and uh, um, we're losing our battle with the ocean. So the village decided to move. And we said, by the year 2015, our goal is to move. Well, 2015 is long gone and we're still here. You know, we've been challenged with trying to get money for the communities of Kivalina, for New Talk, for Shishmaref, and a number of others, and they all need 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars to, to try to make the changes that, that they need or to help them move or to help them rebuild. I think we've got to think outside the box and I just don't know what that means exactly right now. Alaska's north slope remains an icy desert, receiving less than six inches of moisture. Then, in summer, 
the Arctic bursts briefly into life, bringing migrating caribou back to their traditional calving grounds. Once, this vast land belonged to the wild animals. Today, there's still room for the caribou to graze peacefully in a largely unspoiled environment. Now, the Arctic wilderness must be shared with a strange new breed that migrates in trucks and airplanes. Protecting the animal's freedom through strict company regulation, man claims part of their land to help ensure his own survival. Since the first discovery of oil in 1968, Atlantic Richfield Company's operating area at Prudhoe Bay has been the scene of an ongoing adventure. Oil men and their rigs are part of a massive operation designed to tap some 10 billion barrels of oil locked in a natural reservoir beneath the Arctic tundra. The Arctic and Northern Alaska it is a really fascinating area when it comes to land management. In terms of a testing grounds where we can try again to reconcile uh, our need to extract non-renewable resources, but also uh, meanwhile conserve the, the natural resources that, that we love and enjoy. The reason that, that people like me want to live up here or that People like uh, come to the visitor center, want to come and visit and experience this area. So as far as a ground zero for putting together uh, our needs for those resources, uh, oil and energy and, uh, and minerals, and our need for solitude and, and access to open, large landscapes, natural areas, that this is a you know, pretty unique place. I wouldn't call it a paradox because I don't necessarily think it is one for Alaska, and the, the, but the issues are discussed a lot. We talk a lot about uh, oil or gas or coal development. We talk a lot about climate change. I, I think the two are hand in hand here in Alaska because everyone in Alaska, whether it's indigenous folks all the way to, to urban folks, talk about how we live in our environment and we in order to live successfully in our environment, we have to use the resources around us, whether they're renewable resources or non-renewable resources. People who go drill for oil, they're paid a lot of money to lie. I don't think they get paid good enough. <laughs> they always say they won't hurt the environment, they do. Like the fish, the salmon, you know, the pebble mine, everything. It just goes, it's just hurting us. Just for a penny, that's not good. I would rather eat than have that oil. People have asked me, you know, being from Alaska, I go to Lower 48 and before Palin, the big question was, what, what do you think about drilling in Anwar? And Anwar is the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge and it's the northeasternmost part of Alaska. And people say, what do you think about drilling in Anwar? Why aren't we drilling in Anwar? Because people think of the Alaska Arctic as a wasteland. Why not drill there? Well, my rebuttal to that has always been, until we're willing to look at a national conservation policy, I'm not willing to look at sacrificing a wilderness for energy production. The concept of conservation is, is rarely discussed. Turning off street lights, turning off lights, turning off something to stop burning so much energy. Uh, that's a huge socio-political discussion that just isn't happening. It's not happening. People aren't talking about it. In Alaska, as far as the residents go, I would say there's not a consensus whether or not um, there should be drilling one place or another. Uh, just like in the lower 48, our, our population can be torn at times uh, when, when we're debating these uh, pretty profound resource management uh, issues. I mean, they're feeling the, the impacts of a boom and bust economy right now because with declining uh, oil production in the state and, and of course the price of oil going down, uh, the entire state coffers are starting to be impacted by, by that reduction in, in revenues. I think people are starting to also 
take responsibility for the fact that, uh, that the oil industry has been contributing significantly to, um, to the issues that we're seeing globally. The oil revenues that we've derived from this resource does not really reflect the true cost of extracting oil from the ground. The amount of oil on Earth is running out. We have no choice but to develop alternative energy systems, but we also must conserve. So at the global level, there's a, an immediate need to uh, change our economies from a fossil fuel-based economy to a more renewable, uh, less carbon-intensive economy and, and reduce our carbon inputs into the atmosphere to help stabilize these changes. In an area like Alaska, we still see a lot of areas of true wilderness, areas that have been untouched by man, where there's no cell phone service, there's no electricity, there's no utilities, nothing. But there's fewer and fewer of those places on the world every day. And the question is, when do we stop encroaching on those natural areas and say, this is the boundary. We're not going to cross this. We're not going into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We're not going into Denali National Park. We're going to leave those areas for posterity so that people a thousand years from now, living in the United States when the population is four times what it is today, still have areas that are untouched by man that they can appreciate. When we look at how climate change is impacting us, ecosystems, the natural environment, even our economy, Alaska is really the canary in the coal mine. In Alaska, temperatures are warming twice as fast as in the lower 48. In Alaska, we are already seeing real impacts with our own eyes on ice, on frozen ground, on trees, animals, human life, human infrastructure, and all of the things that make Alaska what it is today. My research has focused on how the forest uh, responds in terms of growth and health to uh, the changing and, and variable climate. And uh, we've discovered that um, there are some parts of the boreal forest, including where we're located right now, that are just on the survival limits of the environmental conditions that will support it. It's affecting natural ecosystems. We're seeing things called drunken forests, where trees are canted over sideways because the ground under them is melting and crumbling. If the small glaciers melt here, and we're starting to see that, they're really ret retreating rapidly everywhere. Um, the big ones might go, and so uh, in Greenland and Antarctica, and we're beginning to see evidence of that as well. Uh, there could just be big changes in the planet. So I think it's important to pay attention to what's going on up here. Well, Alaska's uh, useful in a global context for measurements of changes in the cryosphere. Here we have permafrost, sea ice, glaciers, uh, snow accumulation melting during the uh, winter time that are very measurable harbingers of change. And, just about all the indicators that we see in Alaska indicate a response to this global warming. What we know is that climate change is increasing the risk of urgent crises. Climate change is interacting with all of the challenges and threats we already face today. Whether it's massive loss of crops in a drought that is more severe today than it would have been 50 or 100 years ago whether it's an incredible refugee crisis coming out of Syria that was primarily due to the political instability in the region, but was given an extra little oomph by the record-breaking drought they had a few years ago that drove people into the city and led to a 50% unemployment rate, a drought whose occurrence and severity has been linked to climate change. I think right now the, the science, the 
public attention, the president, the secretary of state, and many others are focused only on the concept of how bad climate change is. We actually haven't begun the discussion about what good things there are going to be from climate change. I can tell you I had a conversation with my grandmother who grew up in the, in the woods outside of Fort Yukon and uh, where there was no electricity, there was no running water except the river, and uh, they lived a very primitive, simple lifestyle out in the country, and it got 60 below, it got 70 below, it got 80 below. She has never once said, I want to go back to 80 below zero. She has never once said that I want to go back to 70 below zero and, and have it stay 70 below zero for three or three or four months. So the, the benefit is life is a lot easier at 40 below. The scientists have it figured out. We know what's going on. We know that climate change is happening and it's going to be disastrous. Now it's time for pop culture and the sociologists to take up the reins and maybe that's where the communication needs to happen. The denial part of the climate change thing is, is completely appalling to me because the science supports it. The science supports the fact that the climate's changing and human activity is, is responsible for it. The way I look at this issue is that we have many situations we want to fix, many issues we want to solve. World hunger, poverty, education, access to health care, having a safe environment to live in and for our kids to grow up in. Today, we could pour all of our money and all of our effort into this bucket of something we want to fix. But there's a hole in the bottom of the bucket. The hole is climate change, and the hole is getting bigger and bigger. So if we keep pouring all of our money and all of our effort into this bucket, we're going to need more and more of it, and eventually we won't have enough and it will still be running out the bottom. That's why at some point we have to stop, we have to say, you know what, it's time to patch the bucket. So we saw these things, we talked about them with our colleagues, we urged, you know, be ready, get, understand this, this is a risk. And sure enough, a decade or two after those things really started uh, showing up, being detectable and, and significant, the same things happened in the lower 48. So the western forests of North America have been burning up. Um, huge insect outbreaks have been happening and spreading across the continent. Uh, trees stressed out and dying. It's been happening. Now people in you know, the Rocky Mountain states or in the Pacific Northwest or in British Columbia, they see the dead trees. They see the same things. In essence, yeah, it happened here first. You gotta, you're going to face the same challenges uh, where you live. One of the, the greatest issues is trying to find that balance between human need and preserving natural resources. And so, you know, it makes sense that it's a political issue because we have to confront our lifestyles. You know, anytime you're telling people to change their behavior, it's, uh, it's not an easy shift. I think that's one of the reasons it makes it so hard for people to accept it in the socio-political climate is that it means all of us making sacrifices. You know, ultimately, uh, there's not a fine line it's going to, you know, make other impacts on other resources that are just as, you know, economical. I mean, if you look at the fishing industry up here, seafood in general, you know, warming oceans, uh, declining fisheries, that's going to make a difference as well. You know, so if we can get them to come on board, hopefully more people will listen. I just don't think enough people have seen it in their backyard. It's affected them enough to, to get the buy-in. Um, and, and it's a hard, it's gonna be a hard uh, spot to be in for whoever has to make that decision. You know, winging our, winging our way off of uh, the fossil fuels and, and trying to slow the um, increase of, of greenhouse gases. Um, but you know, maybe it's already too late past that tipping point to make a meaningful change, maybe not. But until you try, you never know. And as of right now, it's, it's just sit around and talk. So, um, makes it tough. With warming temperatures, we could reach a tipping point where we could destabilize those uh, frozen methane 
uh, deposits and then those would be um, released to the atmosphere and those could have a fairly rapid and enormous consequence to the climate system. There's no question that tipping points do exist. When we look at the distant past, we see these points where after you passed it, the entire climate of the planet changed. We don't know when we will reach those tipping points because we've never been in a situation like we are today. We as humans have never conducted an experiment with this planet like we are with climate change. But what we do know is the more carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, the warmer and warmer the planet gets, the greater the risk of reaching one of these tipping points. And when we do, there's no going back. Wind energy is huge on the U.S. right now. It's, it's big, you know, now we're starting to build these big wind farms offshore. Some people are talking about harnessing uh, tidal currents, where we have big tidal currents. But so there's solar, wind, hydro, uh, tidal currents, a lot of different things. We ought to just try everything we can to reduce our emissions of, of, uh, of hydrocarbons, I think. Uh, so the wind farm came, uh, the first three turbines were built in 97, 1997, 1998. We're an island in grid, so Kotzebue is not tied to anybody else, so whatever wind is produced here is goes straight to Kotzebue and reduces our diesel, diesel consumption in Kotzebue. November of 2015, or 14, half of the electrical energy for Kotzebue came from wind. Solar is becoming a much more viable technology too in terms of the, the cost of the technology, but the, the reliability and uh, the scale. So that's the next kind of realm we're getting into is solar power, where this whole, a lot of this site we could foresee with solar covered in solar panels as well. So when you're not, a lot of times they're almost, when it's sunny out, um, it, we're essentially gonna capture whatever we can. We'll get sun when there's sun, we'll get wind when there's wind. If there's wind and sun, we'll get wind and sun. The nice thing about it is those technologies are not tied to the price of oil. So as the price of oil comes up, the price of solar and wind stay about the same. So, which is, which is nice. So as we're using more wind and solar, we're less relying on oil. One of the reasons I came up here is to really focus on what is probably the biggest challenge our planet faces. If there's one thing that threatens opportunity and prosperity for everybody, wherever we live, it's the threat of a changing climate. I met Alaska natives whose way of life that they practiced for centuries is in danger of slipping away. You know, on, on Monday, one Alaska native woman told me she doesn't want her way of life to go on the endangered species list. And I've talked to folks whose villages are literally in danger of slipping away. I really don't think the solution is finding 100 or 200 or 300 million dollars for each community, even though that is that would be the, the best, easiest cure. If you multiply that by the 10 communities that sort of need that level of, of cash influx immediately to help fix their problems. I just don't see it happening. I personally don't think money is the matter, but lives are. If we do not have a move soon, I'm afraid our island will disappear. 
Now, I think the people have given up because who's gonna fund maybe $300 million project to move the village? So who's gonna wanna fund that kind of relocation? There's not a huge discussion. They're planning to move Shishmaref, but this summer, they're gonna pave our roads. They're gonna make, they're gonna waste multi-millions of dollars paving all our roads here. And they estimate it takes about $100 million to move the village five miles up that way or somewhere. To me, I, I, I know if, if we can save this island, it, it would be nice, you know, because this is where we, where we live and we're, we're close to the ocean. I think if we lose our village, it would lose a culture, it would lose a lifestyle. The entire culture is built around having frozen land, frozen rivers, and frozen ice. As those melt, we're seeing the culture change. You can't have the same lifestyle anymore. Indigenous people can't hunt the same animals anymore in the same way. They're losing their ancestral lore and their ancestral knowledge because it doesn't help them in the current situation anymore. I have not understood how deeply, deeply religious people have not yet absorbed the concept of stewardship. It's right in Genesis. It's right there. It's right in the very first book and it tells you that I've given, given you this gift and you need to care for it. Care for this gift. And here we are given this gift and people are like, well, I want some of that. I want some of that. I'm going to take this and I'm going to make some money. And, Really, we need to be thinking carefully this, the, concept, the Native American concept of the seventh generation. It's like, how is this going to affect my great-great-great-great-grandchildren? How are they going to live? What kind of earth am I leaving them? Am I caring for it? It would be nice if we go swamp lives for a, a week. Maybe me and that senator, he can come live at my house and I can go live at his house so he can better understand what we're going through. The the hope is why I come to work every morning. When I walk into a classroom and I see those students and I stand up there and I deliver a lecture with passion and I tell them about the natural world around them, if they'll just open their eyes and appreciate what they have around them and work to conserve those natural resources, that to me is the greatest hope. If each one of us would let people know that it is important, that we do believe it's important, then eventually, hopefully, the people that represent us and have a political voice will voice that opinion and, and make some changes that will be positive for the world. With such a big issue like climate change, we often feel, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? The reality is that our personal choices control about 40% of heat trapping gas emissions in the United States. Our voting choices control much of the remaining 60%. So as individuals, we can certainly do our part. The first thing we can do is step on the carbon scales. It's pretty painless, although you might be surprised by the results. If you Google carbon calculator, the EPA has one. Many other organizations have carbon calculators. You enter where you live, how many people live in your house or apartment, how far you drive, how much you travel for vacation, how frequently you eat meat, how you drive your clothes, what type of light bulbs you have in your house. You enter all of that into a carbon calculator and then it tells you where your personal carbon emissions come from. Because for one of us, it might be travel. That's a big part of my carbon emissions. For another of us, it might be the fact that we like to eat steak dinner or barbecue every single night. For others of us, it might be that we drive a huge gas guzzling car. But there's a different way that each of us produces the most carbon. So the first step is to figure out where it comes from. And then any good carbon calculator will give us recommendations. Hey, if you want the biggest bang for your buck, here's what you can do. You know, do what you can do and then let others know how you feel. And use the ballot box. If people don't go to the ballot box to vo vote, nobody will be able to guess what they were thinking. I think what we need to do, show enough examples uh, show that it, it, it isn't a, uh, a, a short cyclic event. This is a long-term issue that we're dealing with, and 
get away from the politicizing of what they see. We as Americans, we're the ones that need to step up the most. We have all the advantages. We have food, we have water, we have jobs, most of us do. We have educa free education. We don't have war on our own soil, but we're the ones that need to take responsibility as individuals. In 2015, 195 countries went to Paris. They went to Paris because we finally recognized that doing nothing about climate change is gonna be more expensive than doing something. So the Paris Accord with 195 countries agreed to two degrees, but also said let's try for one and a half. And a big part of that is because we are seeing these changes happen faster and to a greater extent than scientists ever predicted. I feel very insecure about the future and about hope for the future because within the next 20, 25 years, Shishmaraf will be underwater due to climate change. Uh, so our future generation, our, my future generation of kids will be the last ones that will actually be on the island of Shishmaraf before it completely erodes away in the future. We need some actions done at these COP conferences that needs to be done right now or the next year or five years because we cannot wait 20 years, 50 years, 100 years until these are implemented because during that time, Shishmaf will be no longer mm. on the face of the earth, will not, no longer be part of Alaska. There's, there's a lot of carvers here in Shishmaraf. You know, anybody can, anybody can pick up a piece of ivory, Dremel or Fordham, and carve. Ivory washes up every day during the summer when it storms, high tide, every day, constantly wash up. Right now, I'm currently writing for a grant to open up my online selling of my work and my father's work. And I'm trying to teach my kids how to carve, at a young age, when he was three months old, when he, he, he came home uh, two months later, because he was a preemie, when he was th three months, I put him right next to me, just like this boy, I put him right next to me when I car, so they can get to hear the sound and the smell of it get into their system at a young age. And that's why I'm trying to teach them. That's how I, I was taught. My kids are the next generation. As for carving, carving goes until I die. I'll put it that way. That's what I'm going to be doing. I like it here. I love it here. When I, you know, when I die, when I get deteriorated away, I'm going to be part of Shishmar. This is my home. This will always be my home. I don't care if we have to move. I'll always come back here. Find a way to come back here. I'm real part of those younger generation that um, um, are talking about, you know, at least saving this village, this culture, this lifestyle. I think it's it must be important to them. They would like to see our culture continue, and that's real important for us. And if it's important for them, that's a good thing, you know. They represent us, and you know, they're going to be our leaders someday. So. They, they, they may be do they may do better than we did. You know? I want you to continue working. Please you remember it's your favorite thing to do in Shishmaraf. All right. I can try it without change wheels. Stop, Chloe. We've got to train the next generation and pass on uh, the information and knowledge and insights and even some experiences of mistakes we've made 
Alaska is warning us. If we don't heed that warning, we too will see impacts at the magnitude they do. But if we heed that warning, if we take sensible steps to reduce the impact we're having on our climate, we can prepare for a resilient future. We can make sure that is a future that we want to live in and that we want for our kids. It's, it's fairly gloom and doom in a lot of respects, you know, because a lot of the scientists feel that this is too little, too late. But I'm real optimistic about it. I think that we can turn it around. We don't know all of the checks and balances that exist in our natural world, and hopefully um, we're going to be given enough time to respond to it. But uh, the little things are, we may think they're insignificant, but they're big.